presentation. So uh, thank you very much, Shira. Thank you very much, Nick, for joining us today. And um, we hope uh, we are going to have um, a very, very open, very, very honest conversation. And uh, attendees uh, would be able to learn one or two things uh, from everything that we are going to share, uh, you are going to share with us today. And uh, for people that are joining us, uh, the goal of this conversation is uh, to have uh, to be as practical as possible and um, to um, to give uh, insights into uh, what is out there and um, not just something that is theoretical. And that was why uh, we endeavor to really uh, make this as uh, informal uh, as possible. And um, so with that, uh, with that already on the way and um, my live streaming uh, going the way I want to go it, if you know by now, you will know that I'm trying to buy time to make <laughs> to make things uh, smooth, run smoothly uh, at the back end. So yes, uh, the streaming is going very, very well uh, on our on our page on the uh, International Journalist Network page. And the next one I want to uh, set up properly um, is um, the page um, on our ICFJ's uh, Pamela Award Forum, but I'm going to get to that in a bit. So thanks to everybody that is joining us today. My name is Paul Adipoju, and I'm the Community Manager uh, for the International Center for Journalists uh, Pamela Award Forum on Global Crisis Reporting. I... Uh, because of the nature of this conversation, I think the best way for me to start is to actually um, share my own journey. I didn't start at, uh, really hard as a journalist. Uh, my background is in science, and um, I began to develop interest in writing, and I found my way during journalism, and I've been covering one bit or another. And um, in very about two or three years ago, I joined ICFJ to lead this uh, uh, to help with the initiative that is geared towards uh, supporting journalists in different parts of the world uh, to improve uh, their crisis reporting. And why is my saying this? Uh, is because uh, everybody's journey to where we are today is quite different, and uh, nobody knows, uh, very few knows uh, where the next destination would be, and which is a perfectly fine uh, scenario. And that's something we are hoping uh, to have a conversation around today. In today's rapidly evolving media landscape, journalists often find themselves uh, navigating unexpected career transitions due to myriads of reasons that include a life event, organizational upheaval, and uh, industry changes. And today we are going to be having an insightful webinar where we will delve into the strategies and opportunities available to journalists pivoting their careers. Considering the interest in this uh, webinar, I think uh, it's con it gives the impression that there are lots of journalists already that are thinking about what their next move would be. And this is a very, very totally fine uh, conversation to have uh, today. And uh, I'm joined today uh, by two amazing persons, uh, Shira, uh, who is the General Manager uh, for Newsroom Initiatives uh, at the Ghost, uh, Boston Globe. Hi, Shira, how are you doing today? I'm well, thank you so much for having me, Paul, and thank you to ICFJ for hosting this. Yes, uh, before I go to the, to, uh, we also have uh, Nick uh, Nicholas, uh, who is also joining us today. How are you doing, Nicholas? And thank you for joining us today. Yeah, thanks so much for being here. It's good to see you both. Yes, so I would like to start by giving our uh, panelists uh, one minute uh, to talk about themselves and uh, where they are and uh, who they represent and their journey to this point uh, in their personal and individual careers. So let's start with you, Shira. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, that phrase ink in your veins, right? Uh, so I think I had that from, from a fairly young age. I have always loved publishing uh, ever since I was really quite young. I was a journalist for 15 years, first in Washington as a reporter covering politics. I eventually became an editor. And then I was an editor here at The Globe. Again, I did a lot of political coverage uh, and it was rewarding and exciting. And I actually couldn't think of a better way to learn about the U.S. and its people and all of the and our democratic system. It was fantastic. Uh, but throughout all that time, I also had this entrepreneurial streak and I found myself uh, keep getting, I found myself keep 
continuing to get attached to projects that maybe would have revenue attached for them, which is really unusual in a lot of newsrooms. So about four years ago, I was coming back from maternity leave and independent of my own ambitions, a role had opened up that was technically in our advertising department, but was really cross-functional, which is probably my favorite thing about it to this day. And so I transitioned out of the newsroom into a role that still works with the newsroom, but leverages my newsroom skills, my relationships, my journalism um, abilities in totally different ways. So happy to talk about that. I should say, in addition to uh, my work at the Boston Globe, I also uh, coach a, a smaller news organizations as well on the revenue and finance. And I love working with uh, former editorial types like myself to build out their revenue and business skills. Thanks, uh, Shira, and uh, we'll be back very soon with you and uh, Nick. Uh, that's yeah. a tough act to follow, but I know. I know, I know. Well, it's good to it's good to hear everything. Uh, so yeah, my name is Nicholas Whitaker. Uh, I'm currently a co-founder of an organization called the Changing Work Collective, and our whole goal is to change work from the inside out, essentially making work a safer and more healthy place to be. I also run a coaching uh, business on the side, essentially helping people in corporate America find uh, passion and purpose beyond paychecks and titles, and essentially folks that are hitting a crossroads in their career, not quite sure what they want to do. Maybe it's a career pivot. Maybe it's going into entrepreneurship like I did, uh, but that's my passion and it's something that's been driving me for quite some time, but I wasn't always doing this. Uh, what I did actually for the prior decade is I was working uh, with Google uh, as uh, had a variety of different hats. I worked in marketing. I worked in partnerships, but primarily focused on the news industry. So I traveled around to 32 different countries, helping stand up, train the trainer programs and helping news organizations and journalists bridge the digital divide from print to digital and broadcast to digital. Uh, and then even before that, I had my own production company and I worked in broadcast news uh, back in the early aughts. Uh, but I've been a storyteller at heart most of my life. So a lot of what I'm doing these days is actually kind of bringing together all the skill sets and all the knowledge that I've built over these many, many decades uh, to help people figure out what is the story they want to tell about their future and how they want to move forward. So that's a bit, but a bit about me in a nutshell. I'm also calling in from Boulder, Colorado. So I see a lot of folks from international uh, all over the world, which is really exciting. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Nick, for that introduction. And um, people are already doing that. So I think we have a lot of people that are familiar with the way we do things uh, in the forum. And I think uh, it's for those that do not know, please go to the chat box. Let us know who you are, what you do, and uh, where you are joining us from. And because we have these two experts with us, uh, I would also uh, be happy to give the floor to one of two people to ask questions live. Um, but if you don't want to come to us live, you can use the Q&A option. Uh, on the Zoom platform to ask your questions. Be free to go personal and um, let's have some case studies and these two amazing individuals can give one or two suggestions or insights regarding how to move uh, with your career. And those that are already watching this live stream on IGNet and uh, the forum, I also welcome you to this session and I invite you I invite you to engage with us let us know who you are and use the chat box the comment box below the video you are watching uh for your questions and the first place i would like to go uh, like the first question that is uh, that i would like to ask and i want your thoughts on we'll go back and forth all around is um for many individuals that have been in this industry uh, reporting stories, covering stories, doing reports is the only thing uh, they are used to. It's the only place they think they are confident uh, to fully function. Uh, how was the experience for you uh, moving what could be the, moving away from what could be described as your comfort zone and uh, what eventually um, made you feel confident uh, to make that bold move? Let me start with you, Shira. Yeah, so for me, I am. Um... After 15 years in newsrooms covering politics, I felt like I had basically done every kind of election or like every kind of government. I'd done every election night. I'd done election night pizza many, many times. Mm -hmm. I'd done it all. And I felt like I was ready for a new challenge. But actually, I wasn't totally sure what that was going to look like. Um, you know, I think also personal considerations can and should play a role in these kinds of big decisions in your life. Uh, I think one of the first steps, though, was just sort of changing my mindset about what I could do. I think a lot of journalists see what they do as an identity. It is a calling, not just a career. Um, and so as a result, sometimes it's hard for us to get out of 
our heads a little bit about what kinds of things are out there or how we could use our skills to uh, apply, to work in other things. I'll give you an example. Um, one of the things I covered often in politics was actually political ads. In America, this is a huge business. They spend billions of dollars on political ads every election. Um, that actually has helped me in my current career in a really unexpected way, because now I work in advertising and I, I understand demographics and targeting and marketing in a unique way. So I, to that point, I think there are two ways you can think about this. If you're to just be getting the conversation even internally with yourself about what you can do. Uh, one is looking at what you cover, like the politics and advertising example I just gave, and then also what you actually like about your job. And I'm sure Nicholas has a lot more to offer on this because he consults people professionally on these transitions. But I think thinking about the things that you love about your job, for me, that was collaborating with journalists. I still do that to this day. I still love working with journalists as people. Uh, and then also what you cover, thinking that those as starting points was really helpful. Thank you very much. We'll go to you, Nick. Yeah, well, Shira, I think you nailed it really with that answer. You know, what I might add to that too, and and I think it really gets down to understanding what your values are. Like, what are you, what are you in it for it for? You know, to, to Shira's point, so many people, I think they get into journalism and it becomes part of their identity. But, you know, kind of unpacking that a little bit and figuring out like, well, what, what exactly is that for you? You know, is it about helping people understand the world around them better? Is it about telling people stories that are maybe unrepresented? Uh, is it about, you know, being in, in community with others and, and helping build community? There's a lot of different reasons that people get into these things. And for me, my transition from broadcast news into my own production company, and then from there into big tech was really a question of like, how do I impact people at scale? That was really the question that I was trying to, to answer for myself is I could tell stories ones or twos here and there in these short documentaries that I was doing. But if I was really going to impact the world at the scale that I really felt like I was capable of, I needed to partner myself with other organizations that were able to help me do that. And I got tapped on the shoulder quite by accident and was offered an opportunity to try my, my skill set within a corporate environment. And I was actually really resistant to it at the time. I was like, I don't want to work for a big tech company. It's really not aligned with my values and the type of person that I want to be. But I did it anyway. And then I blinked and 13 years went by. But my gosh, thank God that I did that because I was able to do so much over the last 10 years to help newsrooms and journalists in ways that I would not have been able to make that kind of impact if I was just trying to tell those stories my own, on, my, on my own. So like for me, with my clients and the folks that I talk to, so much of it's that exploration of values. What are the stories that you tell yourself about what impact you want to have on the world? What are your core beliefs? What are your goals and ambitions and getting really clear with that? And then you can start to be strategic about thinking about, okay, well, how do I leverage that in this new environment, whether that be a pivot to advertising or marketing or a solopreneurship journey or anything along those lines? Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think um, one issue that many journalists that truly desire to move on uh, to something else, to try their hands on something else is... Um, how to cope with the loss of stability um, mm. for instance uh, when you've been when you've been used to a singular formula and um don't forget that everybody has bills to pay uh on uh, on a mid uh, almost on a monthly basis and which restricts um what they could actually do and um so at what point at or what do you think uh the preparation uh, for this career transition uh, should look like. Um, mm -hmm. Shira, what do you think? Um, my advice to people is not something I actually did, but I, because I, <laughs> I was an internal switch, but uh, I would say one of the best things you can do is just talk to as many people as possible and actually treat it like you're a reporter. You, you are on a reporting expedition about yourself, right? You are trying to figure out okay, what other things in this world could I enjoy? I love Nicholas's point about impact, actually. And if impact is really one of your core values, I mean, you can talk to other people who are in impact, who work for nonprofits, who work for foundations, or who work for government, so many things, and see how that manifests in their daily life, right? And I would encourage folks to, uh, as, they, as they go and they talk to people, to a couple of things. First, be be a little strategic, right? Like definitely start with what sparks joy. If you see someone with a really cool job on LinkedIn, message them and like convey that enthusiasm professionally, of course. Uh, but I'd also encourage them to 
ask really pragmatic questions too about the actual role, right? Because we can love a mission all day long, but if the day of the day of the day to day of the job is unsustainable or difficult or you know, it's just frustrating all the time, then you're not going to like it. So just also make sure you ask those questions of like, how much of your week do you spend on doing X versus Y? So I think it's really, you really just ask a lot of questions, which fortunately journalists are terrific at. Nick? Yeah. Ah, man. Yeah. Great, great, great answer. Yeah. I mean, I love, I love this idea, which maybe sounds a little trite, but as a quote, I think it really applies. Your network is your net worth. You know, I have seen this time and time again throughout my career. The only reason that I got a job at Google was because I was open to having a conversation with my old roommate's ex-girlfriend's new boyfriend, you know, and like, it was literally just like <laughs> getting drinks on the roof of the, our building at one point. And if I hadn't had that conversation, like my whole career would have probably been different. The same thing happened on the tail end of my journey in big tech, um, you mentioned, Paul, this idea of job security or financial security. And I, I kind of want to dispel this myth a little bit. You know, we have this idea, at least in the United States, I know there's not a lot of people internationally on the on the call, but in the United States, a lot of us are at will employees. You know, so for the most part, we can be let go for any reason, for no reason whatsoever. And that idea of security is actually kind of a false sense of security. I've witnessed this myself watching for the last decade layoffs and job constrictions and consolidations across the news industry. I experienced it myself after 13 years in big tech when I got an email at three o'clock in the morning telling me that I no longer had a position available for me. So I hadn't at that time thought that there was like a reality where I would suddenly just not have a job. If I hadn't done that networking, if I hadn't been spending the prior four or five years doing exactly what she was, was su suggesting, going out and reaching out to people that I found interesting and that sparked joy for me and asking them about, well, what is it that you do? What, what do you like about your job? What do you dislike about your job? And kept those networking opportunities warm over time. There's no way I would have been able to pivot into what I'm doing now. And luckily, when I got laid off, within three or four days of being laid off, I had a co-founder for my business. I had most of what I needed to set my uh, my solopreneurship business up because I had already been planning this all along. It was a five-year plan for me at the time, which suddenly became a five-month plan, but it was still a plan. And I was able to kind of move forward with it with some sense of certainty in terms of what comes next. So that's what I encourage people to do is like, don't get comfortable. Don't get complacent. Always be networking, always be applying for roles and really look at your career as something that you own and that you direct versus waiting for opportunities just to kind of tap you on the shoulder because that, that only happens once in a while. That's, I agree. Uh, that... I think the best time to look for a job is when you already have one, right? Yeah. Or, or the best time to network is when you already have one. It's so Absolutely. important to like, never stop that process. And if you have to block an hour out of your schedule every week to just write those emails and do it, I completely agree. It's so important. Yeah. Yes, there is this, um, there is this mindset that um, when people leave um, reporting that it's a loss to journalism and um, that some of the best journalists are finding their ways uh, out of the sector because of um, the unique uniqueness of the issue of the sector and um, the dear need to reach profitability. How do we deal with that? And how can we turn around this to still be profitable to journalism, even when you don't, you are not facing the mic, you are not working on an exclusive story, you are not conducting an investigative journalism. So how can that transition still be an addition to journalism? anybody yeah i would say just because you leave a newsroom or a reporting position does not mean you have to stop loving journalism i mean it's it's a consumer product in many ways you can keep reading the news you can keep loving the news i mean there are volunteer opportunities around the news i think of anything from advising a local school's journalism program or volunteering in your spare time to uh, if you are in this position serving on the board of a local publication. I think there's a lot, there's just a lot of really interesting things you can do within this ecosystem that is essentially a community service in and of itself. So, uh, you know, the other thing I don't think we should do as an industry is um, 
criticize people who have decided to leave, right? I, journalism is a calling and it is an honorable career. And I think it's amazing that people dedicate their lives to this and are so passionate about them. I think of the 250 people we have upstairs in our newsroom and how dedicated they are to covering our community. But it's also a career and it's also your life and it's your lifestyle. In many cases, to earlier points, it's your financial security. It's also okay to look yourself in the mirror one day and say, you know, I'm ready to try something else, or I think this would be better for my life, or my personal situation right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with all of that. I think that's spot on, you know, and I've even in my own experience, like this is essentially what I've done is like, I've advised news organizations, even though I'm not technically a journalist now, and I'm not like officially working in the industry. I attend journalism conferences and events. I offer coaching and my services to journalists who are experiencing transition in their careers. I work with other organizations at TAPVI uh, from time to time to advise on their digital strategies and other things. So there's there's skills that I have still, even though I'm not a journalist with a capital J, I never really considered myself to be one in the first place. I was always like a lowercase j journalist. But you know, I feel like you have skills to offer and whether that's in a volunteer capacity or helping your local community come together and better understand what's happening within their community, or it's connecting with other journalists that are just coming up in the industry and offering them mentorship. I think that's a huge value that people can offer regardless of whether they're, whatever their status is, whether they're currently working in a newsroom or not. Um, That's a big piece of what I actually really enjoy about the work that I do is working with younger folks who are interested in newsrooms and journalists, journalism, and they want to step into this industry and helping them with some of the mindset skills and some of the career planning skills that will help them have a longer term career within that industry. So yeah, to Shira's point, you know, I think we need to be really careful about whether we're othering people who have decided to leave the industry and move on to something else. They still have an immense amount of value to provide. And in fact, what I would say is that there's probably an opportunity to try to stay connected with some of those folks and actually learn like, okay, so you've gone into advertising, you've gone into marketing, you've gone into some other industry. How can you help inform some of what's happening within the journalism industry from those other other sectors? Uh, by staying in communication and staying connected with folks, even if they're not necessarily working in journalism anymore. Yes, thank you. We have a couple of questions already that I would like us to take. And um, while reading this, I would really welcome uh, individuals listening that would like to share their personal story and um, insights on this subject, including those that have really good, uh, really personal questions that they will be able to, if they want to speak. So, for you to do that, just raise your hand, uh, use the raise hand option of the Zoom platform, and I'm going to activate your mic. So please, please, I am re- reading the conversations, and I know we have people that have passed through, are passing through uh, these, uh, this transition, and uh, their contributions would be very, very good. So this question I will, um, that we have, and I think is an interesting one that you probably would have mentioned in part, but I think we should zero in, is uh, which newsroom skills did unexpected transfer to your new role? Oh, a, a yes. few of them. Um, you know, you don't think of it as novel when you're in a newsroom because you do it every day, but the ability to write well and to learn a topic quickly and well enough that you can explain it to other people in a short amount of time are incredibly useful skills, right? And like, it's not until you go into other environments where you might realize that not everyone is actually a terrific writer. And in fact, even if you weren't the best writer in your newsroom, you're going to be the best writer in a lot of rooms going forward. So I I would say that is something that I think is completely transferable. You know, the other thing, it's so basic, is just the ability to listen. And that I, you know, I mentioned I'm in advertising now. I It's sales, essentially. And the ability for salespeople to listen is the difference between a good salesperson and a fantastic salesperson. Because they're still doing that exercise of taking that information in and empathizing. So I would put those two, I think, on the top of my list, um, followed by the ability to think critically, right? You, You can basically poke holes in something or see where there are logic gaps. And I think other people might be less, uh, less trained to do that. Your turn. There we go. We're back again. I got frozen there for a second. Yes. Uh, so we're talking about the skills that unexpectedly trans you 
got transferred to your current role? Yeah. So, you know, and apologies, I, I, I wish I would have heard the last part of what Shira was sharing, but uh, so much of what she was saying, sharing really resonated with me. I think so much of it for me is like the storytelling component, you know, being able to tell us a good story and spot patterns across what's going on. Like this has helped me tremendously in marketing. This helped me in partnerships and really, really well. So I was doing partnerships for a while, working with executives within news organizations across the United States and helping them basically with their digital technology and their ad stack tools, which was so far away from where I actually started of actually telling stories and creating narratives for folks. But being able to spot patterns, to be able to hold conversation, to listen actively, to hold space for folks, and be able to help them synthesize a narrative, for me, it was a huge, huge value. And now in my career as a coach and as a co-founder, those skills are still very present. Even when I'm you know, working one-on-one -on -one with a client, so much of what I'm doing feels a lot like what it felt like when I was interviewing people for a documentary or for a story. It's almost exactly the same skill set. The, just, the difference is, is that the camera is a web camera instead of a, a broadcast camera. You know, So I think thinking about like those transferable skills, there's a book that I would like to recommend to just about everybody. It's called From Strength to Strength. Uh, it's by an author, Arthur Brooks. And he wrote this book basically talking about the difference between fluid intelligence and crystallized intelligence. And well, what happens when you go to the second part of your life or second part of your career? You know, we tend to get down on ourselves because maybe we're not as fast on our feet as we used to be, or maybe as innovative as we used to be. And what he says in this book, and I took it to heart, is it's not so much about that as you get older in your career or later in your career. It's about how do you bring together all of the skills that you have to be able to then bring some sort of uh, wisdom or some knowledge that you wouldn't have been able to do otherwise without that experience. So I try to encourage folks to not discount all of those smaller skill sets that they've built, whether it's communication or writing or networking or whatever it might be, and think a little bit about how you reinvent that to bring that forward into the next step of your career. Thank you very much. We'll go back to back with two panelists, uh, with two attendees that would like to talk. I'll start with uh, Samuel. Samuel, you have the floor, and we'll be happy to hear from you. Oh, thank you very much. I, I hope I'm audible. Uh, this is uh, Samuel Mwale uh, linking in from Zambia, uh, Southern Africa. Uh, I, I mean, uh, I, I am settled knowing, you know, that uh, you're saying that you don't necessarily really have to abandon your journalism skills, you know, uh, for you to move on to another career path. But, uh, you know, within our country, you know, there's this uh, influx of uh, journalists, you know, uh, turning to PR, uh, public relations. And uh, to some extent, you know, that has really affected journalism in that, uh, for example, uh, we don't have career memory. We don't have people to look, you know, to look forward to or to look ahead to in terms of, uh, you know, guiding, you know, uh, young ones who are coming through this path of journalism. So I just wanted to, to, to find out really, how, how do we strike a balance? You know, you might have mentioned it, uh, you know, one way or another, but how do we strike that balance to ensure that uh, even as people move on from, let's say, news newsroom journalism, uh, they still that, uh, you know, career memory that, uh, you know, those, you know, who are upcoming, uh, as as journalists can still tap from and uh, you know get inspiration. Uh, I mean, like here in Zambia, we we really don't have you know what I can call uh, you know veteran journalists. Very few, you know, very few veteran journalists because most of them, of course, maybe due to financial you know issues, you know, and other you know uh, personal issues, uh, they, they they decide to move on to you know to other careers. Thank you very much. Oh, I can't hear Paul, but I've gone first a lot. So I, I think, Nick, you should go for it. Yeah, yes. sure. Yeah, so, you know, I think there's parts of this that I think are about that networking question. I mean, that's honestly like why I'm here today. Like the ICFJ, other organizations that bring people together, so much of networking and connection is happening within organizations like this. So I think thinking about, you know, which types of organizations you want to align yourself with, that will put you within the pool of communities of other folks that are doing similar types of work is really, really important. Um, you know, I'd also think about too, what I've found recently on social media, and this was a, a huge kind of surprise to me, but maybe it's not so much of a surprise to most people. As soon as I started putting my story out there and writing on a daily basis, ma mainly on LinkedIn, it started attracting all sorts of people, including a lot of folks from other parts of my life and journalism and beyond. 
And what I've been able to do is actually kind of step more into an advisor or mentorship role for folks that are just kind of starting out simply by sharing my story and the journey that I've been on. A lot of my story is about mental health, men's mental health in particular within high stress environments. I mean, that's basically a newsroom or that's, you know, a big tech organization. Um, and as I've been talking about that and sharing more vulnerably about the challenges that I had and the struggles that I overcame, people have been flocking to me. So even though I'm not technically working in journalism anymore, I'm still connected to that quite a bit. You know, if you're on the other side of that and you're trying to find mentorship and you're trying to find folks who can kind of help pave the way for you a little bit, I think it does take a little bit more of a proactive approach. And I think it it, it is built valuable for folks to join you know, organizations, uh, uh, groups like ICFJ or other types of conferences or events where you can, you know, rub elbows with people, you can talk to folks. I mean, I'm a big fan of like the old school handing out business cards things, you know, when I go to conferences, usually when I go to a conference in person, I spend most of my time in the lobby. I'm not actually going to the events, listening to people talk like you, you can read that, you know, you can get a recording of that. What I'm interested in is spending time with people in the hallways and in the lobby, learning and hearing from them and understanding what they're doing and what they're needing help with. So I encourage folks, whether you're a student or just starting out as a journalist, or maybe you're even a veteran, like getting in there, rubbing elbows with folks, talking with people and like learning about what's actually happening now, not on the stage and not at the podium, talking about what might be in the future. Thank you, Nick. Uh, Shira, do you want a quick? Um, yeah, on I'll, I'll just add one more thing about the conference. I um, went to a conference last fall and it was a very long, it was four days or something like that. And I planned out like which sessions I was going to go to, right? We'd all been in COVID and lockdown for a long time. It was, I think, the first major conference I'd been to in a long time. And like by the end of the second day, I just stopped going to sessions, right? I just started like booking 30 minutes, 30 minutes, 30, like finding anyone I wanted to talk to, look at the attendee list. And I got so much more out of those last couple days than the first couple days. Uh, I can only imagine what it would have been like if I'd really, really planned ahead. Um, so I, I just completely agree on that, on that notion of conferences. And the other thing I'll add is I think when we're contemplating leaving newsrooms or any sort of identity driven career, we think about all the things we're giving up, but we aren't necessarily thinking about all the things we stand to gain, mm. right? I would argue that there are parts of my job today that make me genuinely happier than many of my newsroom roles because it's more collaborative. It's more creative. I'm not confined to deadline pressures in the same way. Like think about all the things you stand to gain too, new skills, different uh, variations in your day, right? Uh, in addition to the stuff you quote are giving up, which I you may not even need to be giving up. Okay, thank you so much. And um, so we have uh, two more speakers uh, that wants to go live. So Sonny Musa, you have the floor and back to back, follow, immediately followed by Kingsley. Sonny, you have All the right. floor. All right, well done. Thank you much for the wonderful presentation. Thank you. This is Radio Gombe, Nigeria. Actually, the competition is very exciting. But uh, I want you guys to with the little resource that young journalists have in Africa develop our careers, considering the fact that we don't have adequate and the means of economy to do so. So we okay. We Thank have you, little. All right. Okay. Yes. All right. Okay. I think I got your question, and I think uh, this question is similar to one that I have pinned down. Um, to uh, that's similar to what uh, Frederick is asking. That what strategies would you recommend for an all-time journalist who is willing to shift gears and start new hustles in an ever-changing journalism landscape? So let's put um, Sonny's question, uh, let's put this together with Frederick. Uh, Sonny is looking at it from a resource-limited setting, while Frederick is looking at it in a very dynamic landscape. So how should we, uh, how should they proceed, uh, Nick? Yeah, so if I understand the question correctly, you know, what I hear in that is like, there's a little bit of resource limitation and there's maybe like a, a limitation of just networking and opportunities and just the availability of other folks that are doing similar types of work. So 
if that's if that's actually the question, you know, the way I kind of think about this too, it's it's a little bit of thinking about what the like second and third order of connections that you have that you can be talking to folks about, uh, the various different areas you might be interested in exploring. For example, like when I first started out as an entrepreneur, I had my own video production company for the better part of a decade before I worked at Google. I didn't know anything about video production. I didn't know anything about running a business. But what I did know is a handful of people that worked in tangential industries. So I knew somebody that worked in commercials. I knew somebody that worked uh, as a photographer. And I spoke with them at length to kind of get a better sense of like, well, how were you able to start your business from scratch? Like, what were the things that you were running into in terms of stumbling blocks? How did you get funding and resources and things like that? And that kind of got the ball rolling for me and allowed me to think a little bit more expansively about how I might approach things instead of it just being about applying for another job uh, or needing like massive amounts of resources and money to be able to start things. I think a lot of times people get tripped up and they're like, well, I think I can do something on my own. I'd like to start an entrepreneurial endeavor, but it feels like there's all of this, uh, all these hurdles that need to be overcome in order to be able to start something out. And I think today, when I started my production company, they didn't have social media back then. Like we didn't have the tools and resources that we have available now. And I think the barrier of entry has lowered quite a bit so that if somebody is interested in continuing their career as a journalist, but maybe it's not within a newsroom or it's not in a traditional environment, there's all these opportunities now to get your word out there and get your message out there uh, and potentially build a business around that. So, you know, what I try to encourage people to think about is like, think, I hate the term, but like think a little bit outside the box, you know, think of like what all the various different ways are that you could potentially start something and think about it, you know, what's the minimum that you can do to get started. And then once you get that ball rolling, then it's a series of questions of like, well, what, what, what's the next minimal thing that I could do? What's the next minimal thing that I can do? And it doesn't necessarily require tons of money and resources. Sometimes it just requires like an email a medium account, you know, and maybe a couple social media profiles to get moving and started. And then from there, you might open up additional doors that provide additional resources and funding and, and whatnot to be able to go even farther than that. Thank you very much. So we have um, two persons. Uh, I think uh, Lightray has a personal experience and uh, would like to hear a story transitioning. Um, Ms. Lightray, you have the floor. All right, thank you so much, uh, Paul. And it's such a pleasure to have the two great speakers there. They've shared some very great perspectives with regards to your skills development, networking, and how you can really zone in to uh, opportunities that are really right in front of you sometimes when you're not looking. And from my experience, what I'm, I wanted to share is um, this aspect of us waiting for us to get burned out before we now start thinking we need to find a career uh, or a different career path often what happens is when we experience burnout, it clouds us from actually tapping deeper into who we should be, the skills we should be developing, uh, where we really resonate well in terms of our path and passion and personal philosophies and vision as well. Um, and this is key because if often we allow ourselves break down before we make that transition, when we make a decision, it can be very costly because you might just take a job that is not right for you. So you need to go into a transition with some clarity, not at a point where you're so weak, confused, dumbfounded, uh, you feel like you're beaten, you're stretched out to pieces. And it's also important that when you're in this period like this, take some time out to have some clarity. It's okay to take a month away from work if you need to get out from a place that is very toxic. Just take a month from work or uh, completely resign and don't be afraid of the future. Sometimes you just got to jump if you're not giving, if you're not having that space to have the clarity to think straight as it is. And then you need to also know how to navigate with your friends, to be open with your friends about opportunities where, where it might come your way. Don't be afraid to ask. Many persons are too afraid to ask because they feel who will look down on me. And then to, we must also be open to the fact that rejections will come. But sometimes it's okay to also go and learn a new course altogether, something different you've never done and then see how you can actually shake your capacity to build new sets of skills. You may surprise yourself that it may not be something you're even interested in the first place, but just to take your mind away from a uh, sterilized routine way of doing something, 
or a skill that had become rot, as it were, now go into something that just triggers you in a more intelligent manner and make you say, oh, okay, I need, so if, for example, you're a left-handed person, a right-handed person, I never develop your right-handed skills usage, that's what a new opportunity can do for you when you expand yourself and not limit yourself only to what you've always known. So learn to take a risk sometimes and surprise yourself on the other side to discover that you might just find something you never expected. And let me also quickly say, People say specialization is key, it's very important going forward. But I have learned from my experience that in opening myself up to the various arms and aspects and expressions and manifestations of the media, what has happened is it gives me a total round perspective on what even the job media and communications is really about. Media and communication is so broad, it's not limited to only journalism in terms of news reportage. Even in news reportage, you can become a data analyst doing some kinds of interpretative journalism that will not be pressurized on you. So you can create a news desk or a new department within your organization if you know how to play the conversations on diplomacy and negotiating your way around uh, the office politics and all of that. You could just decide that you want to write interpretative journalism where you begin to break down trends, uh, you begin to predict things that might happen, which is not very common in places, for example, like in Nigeria, where that space is not even occupied. So when you do some short courses or even a, a PGD program, you just might be surprised how much it will open your mind to it. And then yeah. I love the fact that we talked about business. And most of the time, journalists limit themselves thinking only, only in terms of the journalistic creative work. You don't understand the business side. And the moment you can open your mind to thinking business, thinking pivoting, scaling, uh, and also thinking of how you can monetize your skill sets, monetize your network, it's amazing how you suddenly wake up from a sleepy slumber of lethargy, of being stuck in one place, because suddenly you are beginning to see the greens, as it were, or a, or a moment of personal passion of expansions welling inside of you to know that you really want to go beyond uh, converting things like mentorship, advisory uh, work, because if you've done 10 years in a particular beat, that makes you a specialist. So you can become an advisor, you can become a mentor, you can, there's so much more you can do. And the value chain, sometimes we just take time and study the value chain and the ecosystem of the media and communications wow. landscape is amazing. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Kingsley has been waiting. Uh, Kingsley, uh, you have the floor. Kinsley, are you ready for us? Okay. Uh, while waiting for Kinsley, uh, let's quickly take some questions. Uh, okay, Kinsley is ready. Kinsley, you have the floor. All right. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, good evening uh, to us all. My name is Kinsley, and uh, a broadcast journalist from Ghana. Uh, in fact, I, 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 I very much appreciate the conversation we are having today, and uh, I tend to side more with the last contributor. Honestly, it all has to do with uh, capacity building one way or the other. Uh, in fact, I agree with most of the contributors uh, on the fact that in Africa, for instance, where I come from, uh, sometimes it's difficult. Our job in terms of remuneration and all of that is a very difficult terrain. We tell we have many people coming into the, 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 the field and uh, in terms of uh, remuneration, resources, a very difficult to have. What me, I intend doing, you know, I have been doing is we need to be having, uh, putting ourselves together, uh, forming groups, and of course, taking advantage of certain uh, things that is happening. Of course, uh, me, for instance, socialization is also a key for me. I have decided for the past 10 years, we are going along the uh, blue economy area, the climate change and environment, and so on and so forth. And since I joined, since I took that decision, there's no any time that there's any climate conference or there's no any blue economy issues or conference that are happening that we will not be part of. Uh, I must say that even as I speak, uh, USAID are uh, having a, a project in Ghana in fisheries and a friend and myself are uh, putting ourselves together, applying uh, for some of the projects that we need to do. Uh, we are just about uh, getting it and we are now, my, we are just about three people are uh, raising as consultants and of course we will even bring in many other journalists support the kind of project that we are doing. So it's more about 
capacity building is more about identifying certain areas that we can take advantage of. Because our normal job, me, for instance, I work with the state broadcaster, Ghana Broadcasting Corporation, and it is even difficult, even straying away from the main journalism core job uh, to be doing other things, which may be, it may not be okay with them. But when you are still within the industry, doing other things, because most of the things that we will be doing, especially the project I'm talking about, there will be so many stories that will be generated by ourselves, by the people that we will, we will bring on board. They are also journalists. So I think that it's a good conversation and appreciate the concern from especially our part of the world, Africa, for instance. The avenues are not there, but what we need to do is to build our capacity, identify certain areas that we can take advantage of. NGOs and other civil society groupings that are available, they need us. They need us more. Most of our jobs, they will need, they need communication uh, operators. And we fall within that area. They want most of the things they do to be publicized, to be established. And it is part of the, uh, uh, okay. that, they are, that they are looking out for. So when we avail ourselves uh, based on the kind of capacity we have, and maybe for, say, blue economy area, climate change, environmental yeah. issues, any other areas, when it happens like that, you stand a chance. They invite you. They call. Well, immediately, okay. there's any other thing like that. Some of us, they call, and we rather even look for other people for them. So I think that we need to organize ourselves, put ourselves in groups, and uh, maybe two, three, if we need to even register. Oh, we lost Kingsley. We lost Kingsley. So thank you, everybody, for, uh, for the feedback. Thank you, everybody, for the feedback. And uh, any quick thoughts on the comments so far, Nick, before we move to the fast-paced questions? Yeah, I, I would love to just kind of touch briefly on, I think it was two people ago that just mentioned, they were talking a little bit about that idea of burnout and like not waiting until they're burnt out to then try to make decisions in terms of what comes next. And I think it's a really, really important point to highlight. So many of the people that I talk to, whether it's in the journalism industry or in the tech space or wherever, they're usually coming to me after a major catastrophe that's occurred. Either they've experienced a job loss or layoff, they've hit burnout, they're on a medical leave, there's something along those lines. And then they're like, all right, what do I do? And it's like, ah, yeah, I wish you would have talked to me six months ago. Like we would have been able to help you a lot more. And I think this kind of goes back to a little bit about what Sheer and I were talking about earlier is like, it's never too early to start networking. It's never too early to start being strategic about thinking about this. It's the same thing with your mental health and your well-being. If you don't have your well-being and your mental health, nothing else after that's going to be effective. So that plus, you know, if you're coming from a place of scarcity or if you're dealing with a mental health concern uh, or if you're dealing with burnout and then you're trying to be strategic and think about what comes next for you, you're coming from a depleted place. And it's going to be a very, very long and hard road for you. So what I encourage people to really think about is doubling down on that mental health and that well-being. If you find yourself in an unhealthy or a toxic work environment, toughing it out maybe isn't the best decision for you. Taking some time off, reevaluating what you need, and then moving forward from a place of being resourced, I find to be a much better uh, approach. That's essentially what I did with my own career. Like I took a three and a half month long mental health break because I was in an incredibly toxic environment with bullies and people mobbing uh, within the workplace and making it really, really difficult for me to just function as a human being. I took that three and a half months off. And when I did that, that's what I came up with my next chapter, which is what I'm living right now. If I hadn't taken that time, who knows what I would be doing right now? So again, I just want to encourage folks to really think about this as like your mental health is the most important thing that you can protect in order to be able to figure out what comes next in your career. Thank you very much. This is the fun part. Quick oh, questions. Quick. Can I just add one more quick thing about this? Because I, okay, so I, okay, I finished okay. up business school in May and one of the sort of constant topics of conversation amongst my class there was whether the next job was a push or a pull for you, right? Yeah. And I just want to normalize this idea of like, sometimes you just need to get out of the situation and your next job may not be the most perfect job. It may be a lateral move, right? Mm -hmm. But if you can get to a place where you can think more clearly, have some room to breathe, mm -hmm. I mean, that in itself will be worth it for you in the long run. Like these are long journeys, our careers. They're 40, 50 years sometimes, right? So if you think about the the very, very long lens of it, I, I think it's well worth it if you just need to get out and do something else for a couple of years. Thank yeah. you very much. Lots of questions. So quick one, fast Robin right now. Hi, I'd like to stress that journalists who choose to leave can always come back. But why do I get the sense that people who left or who saw others leave 
treat it as if the goodbye is permanent. Now to you, Shira, I'm directing this. Uh, could you see yourself getting back into the newsroom? It would take a really special kind of role to do it. I think my days of editing copy or sort of run it, or managing uh, reporters, I view that as my last chapter, right? And it's not my next chapter. Um, I think it's... You know, I think it's a great job still. And I love one of the best parts of my job today is I still get to work with journalists, but it would really have to be a specific kind of like strategy or like editorial director kind of role where I was still being able to use some of my skills that I've developed that I enjoy so much, you know, it sort of awakened other sides of me in this new role. That was Thank not you even a fast answer. That was not a fast answer. I'll, <laughs> no, I'll it's do better. Okay. It's fine. It's fine. Nick, you take this. How does one yeah. How does one deal with or adjust to the feeling that they've lost a sense of purpose and doing work that carries meaning for society, even mm -hmm. though they take a different career path? I love that. Yeah, I saw that come up in the feed. It was something I was hoping we'd have a chance to jump on. So for me, I think it's so much about the North Star. Like, what's the higher purpose that you're actually trying to achieve? And you can find ways of executing on that in anything that you're doing. You know, for me, again, it was really helping to tell other people's stories, tell stories from people who maybe don't have uh, as big of a voice uh, as they should, uh, to tell the stories that people don't get a chance to hear all the time. And, you know, since I'm so far outside of journalism now, it's like one might think, well, it's like I've lost my purpose, I've lost my direction. Well, what I'm able to do now is I'm able to find other ways of still serving that core purpose, that core need, but doing it in different ways. You know, so now I do it on social media. I'm actually creating essentially a media company with changingwork.org, which helps talk about how to change work from the inside out and the systemic issues that are happening within organizations that cause poor mental health outcomes and poor performance and all of those things. So for me, there was a little bit of like a 10 year period there where I was like, I felt a little adrift and I didn't feel like I was necessarily living my core purpose. Okay. But in hindsight, what I realized is it was like a progressive step towards that little by little as I was building my skills and building my network. And here I look back and it's like, oh, I'm actually doing exactly what I had set out to do 20 years ago. It just looks a little bit different. Thank you. Next question. It's quite interesting that I got an invite to be part of this seminar at a time when I'm planning on transitioning to higher international relations related field or communication. I feel like I've done my part and I need to create space for new ideas and those two have fire for it. Uh, my question is, how did you guys feel like when you finally transitioned, say a few months into the new career? Was there any regret? Would you go back? Do you miss the feel of a news chase? Shira, quick one. I'm still close time. enough to the news that I don't miss it actually that much. Uh, and in fact, I find I look at it through a different perspective as more of a consumer, right? I think there's a big benefit to that. And this is why they have journalism fellowships or one of the reasons they have journalism fellowships to sort of take you out of the daily mix for a while because you actually look at your job completely differently afterwards. And I would say my first, actually my first couple months into this job was February, was March, 2020. So that was an interesting time. Um, but beyond that, uh, COVID of course, um, but beyond that, I think actually part of me um, even felt some relief if that's helpful to folks that I could do other things that I wasn't sort of confined to one career path and one trajectory. Uh, and I also felt actually just excitement that there were new things to do that was still contributed to my personal professional mission, but were different than what days had been before. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you so much. So quick one, I think uh, you both advised against um, waiting until you are fired to plot your next move, but the mistake has been made. Uh, the general has uh, had um, he, he has already been laid off from an organization. So what are the best opportunities for an individual journalist? So I think Nick should answer this. And Shira, mm -hmm. what I wanted to do is go through the remaining questions and pick your favorite. <laughs> while, nice. while Nicholas okay. does that, answer the question of somebody that waited till he or she was laid off. Yeah, take as long as you want to answer, Nick, please. I will. I'll take my time. Yeah, you know, so I, I get this question a lot and it usually comes in a few different flavors. I, I had actually a client not too long ago that actually came to me and he was like, do you, have you ever worked with anybody else that made the mistake of quitting their job like I did and ruined their career? <laughs> and I was like, well, first of all, 
I challenge the question in the first place is whether or not that's even a perspective that is helpful. You know, whether it's a job loss, a layoff, or you've decided to leave an organization, I think the key is to really, again, recenter yourself, not move forward from a place of panic and scarcity. It might be finding a good enough job that tides you over until you can find the, the real job that it is the one that you want. Um, if you're an independent journalist, I think it actually gives you the opportunity to be completely unfettered and untethered to any particular organization. And it opens you up to maybe like create your own voice and your own uh, activity within the space. You know, so I would encourage folks to like resort back to building their core skills. So whether that's storytelling or news gathering, you know, editing, whatever it might be, like focus on those core skills and pay attention to what lights you up and what really feels good about that type of work that you're doing. That's going to help you figure out what that next career opportunity is and which direction you might want to go. But before you do any of that, I think the thing to really focus on is mindset. If you're coming from a place of, I just lost something, well, it's going to be a very hard road for you. But if you're coming from a place of something just amazing happened and I have an opportunity to reinvent myself or go in a different direction, well, there's all these new opportunities that are presented to you then. So again, so much of it for me is about mindset and fixing your mindset in a way that's expansive, it's opportunistic, it's forward-looking, and not looking so much in the rearview mirror. Thank you. Thank you very much. Shira, do you have a favorite question that you like to yeah, answer? Yeah, so this is why from Shira, Alina. Sorry, uh, why Shira is doing that, Nicole, also you go through it and yeah. pick your last question to answer. Shira, you have the floor. Right. I'm taking Elena. Uh, I am in a bit a different space, corporate manager moving to journals and producing communications, which is probably insane, but I just don't have a motivation to stay in corporate. Do you have any suggestions for people with business experience who are interested in creative jobs? Uh, so my suggestion would be actually not totally different from maybe journalists who want to try something new, which is if you have the bandwidth personally and professionally, um, try the side hustle, right? See if you like it. Uh, I'm a big fan of trying things out. And I recommend this to friends all the time. You can do this in as little as a couple hours a week if you have that to just try things out and see if you like it. Worst case, you end up making a connection with someone in the field who has direct experience with your work, and that can be a benefit in the in the long run as well. So, just want to put in put in a plug there for contract work because I think it is a really great way. <laughs> yeah. Okay, nice plug, Nick. Yeah, have you made a decision. Yeah, I have. And actually, I'll just double down on what Sheer was saying too. Contract work, it's actually how I got my first roles in big tech. I worked four and a half years as a temp contractor and vendor, and it opened up so many opportunities for me that I wouldn't have had otherwise. But I like, uh, I think it's Benita. Uh, uh, she, uh, they ask, skills and work match is not difficult. I feel that business development and monetizing your network, that is the issue with most journalists. Can you please elaborate on how to do this? So this is at the core of what I'm actually doing with the Changing Work Collective. You know, so many of the people that we're working with are coaches, facilitators, practitioners of conscious business, not so much good on the marketing, not so great on the sales skills. So what I encourage people to think about is, first of all, think of yourself as a marketer first and foremost. Think of yourself as a salesperson first and foremost. Whatever you're putting out there into the world, you're going to have to frame it in a way that people resonate with, and you're going to have to use different platforms and strategies to get it to them at the time that they need it in the way that they need it. It's no different than the same problems that an entire newsroom is trying to deal with, right? It's the same core issues. How do we market and how do we sell and how do we get our content to our audiences in ways that is meaningful to them? So what I would think about in terms of monetizing your network, it's almost the wrong question. I would actually be thinking about how do you serve your audience powerfully in a way that attracts them to what you're offering and then have opportunities for them to be able to contribute, whether that's a Patreon or it's some other sort of uh, funding mechanism. I've got friends of mine that have six figure jobs monetizing a newsletter that they've started writing seven or eight years ago. I have other people that are doing the same thing with video on YouTube. So there are all these opportunities to bring revenue in. It doesn't mean that it's easy by any stretch, but what you can do is you can part your, your partner yourself with other people that have skills that maybe you don't have. So what I did with my uh, Changing Work Collective and with the organization that I'm doing right now is we pulled together a whole pool of people that are subject matter experts that can help people stand up businesses, 
get them from get their content in front of the audiences that are needing their services and learn from one another. And I think that's the biggest thing is like, don't try to do all the stuff to for, don't try to do all this alone. Try to do it in community, find other people that are trying to solve similar problems and yeah. solve them together. That's always going to serve you more than trying to just lone wolf it out there. Yeah. Firamsa has been raising hand for a very long time. So can you make it a quick one? Firamsa? Your mic. So, from Zatalera, we have the floor. No, I can't hear you. I can't hear you. So while waiting, um, I don't think we have time to. Adis, Adis, can you speak? Yes. Yeah, so um, so let's take our last remarks. I don't want to keep. <laughs> You're waiting longer than I. We already passed uh, uh, the time slot for this session. I'm sorry, we have lots of questions that we couldn't go through, and um, which shows that um, this is an issue that a lot of journalists are really, really concerned about, and is a great one to have uh, from the perspective of crisis reporting. I think this is also an opportunity for you uh, to see how you can improve, uh, help support uh, an initiative that you are passionate about, a cause that you are passionate about, because it's actually directs you to properly challenge your energy. Uh, Adis? Adis, can you talk? Okay. No, no, no. I think we can take more, uh, yeah. more than enough questions. So let me start with Nicholas. What are your last words? Well, I mean, first of all, thank you for having me. I think it's really just lovely that we're even having this conversation. And I would just offer to people to try to stay open the possibility, try to connect with other people who are also trying to solve some of these same problems and try to share as much as you can about your own experience. I think so much of this is about helping destigmatize the struggle of career transitions and destigmatize the struggle of the shifts that are happening within the industry. So many people that I talk to, they just keep it to themselves. They think it's just them that's having to deal with these things. And it's a universal problem that so many people are, are trying to deal with. So get out there, share your voice, share your story, talk to other people, ask powerful questions and do the really good work that you do as a journalist, but focus it on your own career. I think that's always going to serve people really well. Thank you very much, Nick. Uh, Shira? Yeah, I'll echo what Nick said and also uh, gratitude. Thank you so much for having me today. Thank you so much to everyone for their terrific questions. Uh, it's clear there's a lot of interest in this, which is, I, I think, great. Um, you know, I would say uh, to just keep in mind that you should be open-minded, as Nick mentioned, and you are failing no one if you decide now is the time to leave the newsroom. You are not failing yourself. You are not failing your readers, right? It is okay to make a personal professional decision about what's best for your future, right? If you're looking for someone to give you permission, here I am. I'm doing it right now. It is, it is okay. So, um, and to just be open and creative and keep thinking about what you stand to gain, not what you're leaving behind. Thank you. Thank you very much. I know people are already saying goodbye, but I have a, a very quick announcement to make. Uh, from next week, we'll be hosting, I'll be hosting, uh, we, we are starting a month-long uh, series on disarming, uh, this, which is empowering the truth. Uh, this is an annual event uh, with at the high CFJ. I, I've just put a link uh, in the chat box for you to register to participate in our series of uh, webinars. Uh, the goal is um, to really, really empower journalists uh, to really, really uh, promote the truth. Uh, journalists in every corner of the world uh, throughout the month of March uh, will come together once per week in March to learn tools and strategies for elevating truthful information above the tide of misinformation. This is part of ICFJ's second annual Empowering the Truth Global Summit. Uh, the summit offers a series of online training sessions in seven languages led by experts with uh, regional knowledge, uh, journalists, fact checkers and students are going to learn skills to help them amplify the reach of reliable facts and use innovative means to produce uh, factual content and um, the 
the attendees will also be eligible for funding to pursue groundbreaking ways to better distribute facts online, including through collaboration, subject matters, experts, or by leveraging new technology. So it promises to be an amazing time. And um, talking of opportunities, talking of looking beyond uh, the newsroom, uh, if you are able to attend at least three out of the four sessions, you qualify to apply for our for a grant. So so this is a really good grant opportunity and uh, if we are looking for opportunities to pivot you have an idea that you're already thinking about how you are going to work on it uh, this is a great opportunity for you to try your hands on what you think is a way forward an innovation a solution or a unique approach so i really 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 i'm really really selling it uh this session to every journalist on this call every person that is working i will be the moderator of all of the sessions throughout the match and I really, really want to see you. So if you're already talking about new opportunities, you're talking about trying to test your hand, you're talking about career transitions, you are looking at looking beyond the newsrooms, this is an opportunity for you to learn some skills, gain some insights and be eligible uh, for a grant. So please check the chat box. I've dropped the link and we, I hope to see you uh, starting from next week. I want to give a big shout out to all of our panelists. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nick. And Shira, you can see that we can pull this for two hours. <laughs> we can actually push it for two hours, uh, which was something that we started with. So thank you everybody that attended. I wish you the best of luck and uh, congratulations in all your future endeavors. And uh, bye from me. Thank you, Paul.